Church, how are we this morning? Love to hear it. Uh, for those of you who I haven't had the pleasure of meeting yet, my name is Jason. My wife Betsy and I and our six kiddos have called this church family home for the last decade plus, and I'm glad that we are here today. And um, it's just another opportunity for us to gather and to be reminded of God's goodness in our life as we saying, I was just overwhelmed by the goodness of God that I have nothing to bring him but filthy rags, but he has done everything for us. Amen? Amen. Amen. And so uh, this morning, I am excited, I'm humbled, I'm nervous, I'm hopeful, and I'm prayerful that God's spirit and God's scriptures would speak to us this morning, that we would feel encouraged by him this morning. And I just want to start by asking a question of why are you here? Why are you here? Not why are you on this planet Earth, okay? But why are you in the room today? Are you here? Did you come here today to sing? Did you come here today to see friends? Did you come here today to hear from God? Or it's because what your family does on Sunday mornings has come. Are you here to be reminded of what is true? Or are you here because you feel tired, you feel troubled? You feel overwhelmed and you're looking for answers. You're looking for peace. I'm sure all those reasons and more represent us today. I know it rep- some of these, multiple of these represent me today. And uh, just confession, it has been a hard week for me. I have felt the attack of the enemy in so many ways. And I stand here before you this morning very weary and very tired. And... Uh, But I am anticipating God to continue to do what he does, is bring glory to himself. So uh, regardless of how you're coming in the room this morning, we're glad that you're here. You are here. God brought you here this morning. Second, Jesus desires for you to know how much you are loved by him. If you hear nothing else today, hear this. Jesus loves you. And part of his love for you is drawing you to this place this morning. And I hope as we spend our time today that we are strengthened, our faith is strengthened by his spirit. And so we're just going to go before the Lord right now and we're just going to pray. I'm going to just guide you and ask that you would pray uh, these things. And so let's go to him now. Take some time to ask the Lord to use his scripture and spirit to help you know how much you are loved by him. Ask the Lord to help those around you to hear, receive, and delight in his truth. Pray for them by name if you know their name. And then lastly, would you just pray that God would strengthen our church family this morning? Well, God, we thank you that you hear our prayers. Amen. Well, as a reminder of where we are, we are in the book of Luke. And this uh, morning, we're going to be in Luke chapter 18, 1 through 8. So go ahead and open your Bibles to Luke 18, 1 through 8. And it's always helpful when we're in Scripture to be reminded of the Scriptures that are around it. It helps bring context. It helps bring life. It helps bring color. And today is no different. Last week, we talked about the end of Luke 17. And we talked about the Son of Man, Jesus, will return. So that Jesus came, he lived a sinless life, he gave himself up so that you and I might be brought back into relationship with God, and he declared that one day he will return. And until that time, we wait, we wait. And so Jesus hasn't come yet, and so what are we supposed to do in the meantime? Well, today in Luke 18, it's clear from our passage that the answer is we are to pray. As Jesus has now uh, ascended into heaven and we are left here on the earth where trouble surrounds us, where brokenness still prevails, 
Jesus says to pray until he returns. And so just being uh, honest with you this morning, personally over the last year, prayer is an activity in my life that God has over and over again put in front of me to study, to meditate on, to desire to participate in. I've read several books, listened to many podcasts, spent many hours thinking and wrestling on this topic alone. And I can honestly say that in the last 10 months, I think I have prayed more in those 10 months than I have the last 10 years combined. And the reality is, is this both saddens me, but also it makes me ecstatic. Saddened because I feel like so much time was lost, but ecstatic because it has deeply enriched my relationship with the Lord and deeply grown my dependence on Him, resulting in more joy, more peace, and more praise in seeing Him at work. And so the topic of prayer could take endless months of sermons to dissect endless angles and joys that can be found in it. And we only have a few minutes this morning, but I hope to stay true to the aim of the passage while inviting us to further pursue and participate in prayer on our own. So with that being said, let's jump into Luke 18, 1 through 8. Now he, Jesus, was telling them a parable to show that at all times they ought to pray and not to lose heart, saying, in a certain city there was a judge who did not fear God and did not respect man. And there was a widow in the city, and she kept coming to him, saying, Give me legal protection from my opponent. For a while he, the judge, was unwilling, but afterward he said to himself, Even though I do not fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow bothers me, I will give her legal protection. Otherwise, by continually coming, she will wear me out. And the Lord said, Hear what the unrighteous judge said. Now, will not God bring about justice for his elect to cry to him day and night? And will he delay long over them? I tell you that he will bring about justice for them quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? So, Jesus shares another parable, another story with us, but before he does that, he makes it abundantly clear uh, what the purpose of the parable is, which is really helpful, okay? Sometimes Jesus gives illustrations or tells stories that kind of can be a little cryptic, and you're like, Jesus, what are you actually saying here? And actually, those are for our good because they help us just chew on and meditate what God has for us. But what's awesome about this one is it just explicitly says at the very beginning, what the purpose of the parable is. And so as we look at 18, it's kind of dissected into a couple parts. One, we have this invitation to pray at all times. Second, we have a parable or this story to illustrate prayer. And then at the end, we see Jesus asking the people three different questions. Yet he doesn't answer all the questions. And then so in light of that, we will look at what does prayer look like in our own lives. So in verse one, it says, he was telling them a parable to show that at all times they ought to pray and not to lose heart. We are to pray at all times. Why? So that we won't lose heart as we wait for him to return. To not lose heart can be equated to being weary, being exhausted, to losing uh, your spirit, like being spiritless, having no energy, if we are followers of Jesus, why would we lose heart? Hasn't Jesus freed us from our sin, our shame, our burdens? Shouldn't we always be joyful knowing that we can anticipate Jesus' return? Yes, but we can become weary because our flesh is still real. Brokenness in this world is still real. The enemy is still real. Circumstances will be challenging relationships will become fractured. Darkness surrounds us and temptation constantly knocks at our door. These things can and do produce stress, anxiety, exhaustion, self-dependence, and on and on and on. And when our mind is fixed on these things, we can quickly lose heart. We can become troubled by this world. 
But when our mind is fixed on these things, we can quickly forget about Jesus and what he has done. And we will forget the fact that he will return to bring us home to be with him. And all of us can admit at some point in the last month or in the last week or in the last day or maybe even in the last few hours that you have felt burdened. Jesus desires that we begin to feel, that when we begin to feel troubled by these things that surround us, that we, uh, we would pray. It's clearly stated in here, pray at all times so that you do not lose heart. Trouble will come and what should we do? We should pray. When we begin to drift away from his way, we pray. When we begin to feel troubled by the things of this world, we pray. When we take our gaze off of him and remember him, we pray. When we begin to lose heart, we turn to him and we pray. What is prayer? Well, prayer in its most basic sense is just communicating with God. It's just like you and I, if we're in a relationship, we're having a conversation with each other, we're speaking, we're listening, we're dialoguing with each other. That's what prayer is, but it's with God. It's communicating with him, both speaking and listening, I believe. Prayer is an opportunity to be connected with God, to enjoy fellowship with him, for God to feel near, to feel close to us. Prayer is a, a chance for that we can make requests to him, that we can be honest before him, that we can praise him and we can exalt him to declare our need for him. It's a time to set our part, our mind on things above and not on the things of this earth. When we pray, it helps us not to lose heart. Jesus says in John 16, in this world, you will have trouble, but take heart for I have overcome the world. So when we begin to lose heart, grow anxious, get frustrated, embrace the ways of the world, what is your first response? Is it to try to fix the situation? Is it try to plan a way out or plan a different way? Is it to try to just escape and withdraw from the difficulty that's around you? Or is your first thought to lean in and pray and to ask God for help? And so why should we always pray so we don't lose heart as we wait for Jesus to return? It seems so simple, right? It's clearly laid out for us, but yet it can be difficult. And Jesus gives us this story, this parable, to illustrate that our ability to be able to come before him in prayer, which I think is helpful. So verses two through six, just to remind us of what they say. It said, in a certain city, there was a judge who did not fear God and did not respect man. And there was a widow in that city, and she kept coming to him saying, give me legal protection for my opponent. For a while he was unwilling, but afterward he said to himself, even though I do not fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow bothers me, I will give her legal protection. Otherwise, by continually coming, she will wear me out. Hear what the unrighteous judge said. So in this story, in this parable, we have a couple of players involved. We have the widow. The widow is powerless in the eyes of society. She is lacking protection. She is needing protection. And she is pleading for help. She's pleading for favor. She kept coming over and over and over again to the one who could actually give her help. She came to the judge because the judge is the only one who could help her. We also see the unrighteous judge. This judge does not fear God or respect others. There's no desire to help. And he's only looking out for his own interests, right? The only reason he like appeases the widow is because he's like, okay, just stop bothering me, okay? I'll, I'll fulfill your request, just stop bothering me. And then there's a third character that isn't really mentioned much, but it's the opponent. It's the opponent, the one who is against the widow, putting the widow in a state to cry out for help, for protection, for uh, need in that way. This parable is an example of a contrasting parable, meaning uh, it's talking about something later or something lesser to point us to something greater. So in, when we were in Luke chapter 11, you guys remember that about a year and a half ago, we were in Luke chapter 11. And uh, 
We saw this example in Luke 11. It talked about, hey, if an imperfect friend can give help or an imperfect father can give good gifts, how much more will a perfect God give help and give good gifts? So when we look at Luke 18 today, that, that's how we should look at it. A picture of something lesser to point us and remind us of something greater, all right? So you see, you and I, we are like the widow in the story because we are the ones making a request. We are the ones in need. However, we are not widows. We are children of God, amen? We are not poor. We are not helpless. We are children of God. And God in this story is like the judge who has the power to grant protection and to give comfort. However, he is not just the judge, he is a loving father. You see, the widow was a stranger to the judge, but we are God's children. We are known and we are loved by him. The widow had no direct access to the judge, but God's children have open and free and any time access to him. The widow was a nuisance to the judge, but God's children are never a nuisance to him. When we as his children come to him, he is never bothered by us coming to him. The widow has no promise of protection, but God's children can constantly declare the promises of God seen throughout the scriptures. The widow had no assistance in her request before the judge, but God's children have a spirit to assist us in our prayers. The widow was probably poor and in great need, but God's children have been given every spiritual blessing in Christ. And if this unjust judge will hear the request of this unknown widow, how much more will our Father in heaven hear his children's prayers? And not just hear them, but desire them, long for them, long for communication with his children that they may know how much they are loved. Do you believe this? God is not like the judge. He is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in love and kindness. He's not bothered by us, but delights in us. He wants to help us in our times of need. The contrast is to encourage us in our prayers, knowing that God is nothing like this judge. God is everything the judge is not. And this gives us confidence and should strengthen our desire to move towards God in prayer. When troubles come, when we need protection, when the enemy attacks, we move towards God in prayer and say, God, would you help me? And why do we need help? Because we have an opponent. There is an enemy and he is real. Our opponent is not someone who's just trying to take legal advantage of us. Our opponent is a thief that has come to steal, kill, and destroy, and to overwhelm us with trouble, to break our spirits, to burden us beyond what we can handle. The enemy that we have is a truth manipulator. He will lie to us, whispering in our ears, thinking that his way is better than the way of Jesus, and it's just not true. The enemy is like a lion on the hunt looking for someone to devour. In church, I'm letting you know right now, We are on his radar. If we claim God to be our father, if we proclaim that we are his children, that the enemy is after us, he wants to devour us. And so we need help. I truly believe this, that the more we understand uh, the enemy's desire to bring trouble upon us, the more we will depend on the Lord to strengthen us, to sustain us, and the more we will turn to him in prayer. Think about this. We have instant whenever access we do to the Heavenly Father, which is unfathomable. If I told you that you had unlimited access to get financial help from Warren Buffett, you would take it. If you had unlimited access to Joanna Gaines to help make your house what it should be, you would take it. And for my kids of the 90s, friends, if you needed help with home improvement and you had access to Al Borland, you (laughs) would take it. Why? 
because they can help you in whatever it is that you are needing help with. And you would quickly run to those conversations to seek help. How much more when we are troubled by the enemy that prowls around like a lion looking to devour us, should we cry to God for help? Who longs for it? Who's there for it? Who's ready to listen? Who's ready to bring comfort? Church, family, the Lord delights in the prayers of his children. The Lord delights in the prayers of his children. And if you uh, are having a hard time believing that, that's okay. Ask the Lord that he would strengthen you and, and let you know that that is true. After this story that Jesus gives to illustrate that we can come to him in our time of help, he asks three questions. The first two are in verse seven. And it says, now, will not God bring about justice for his elect who cry to him day and night, who beg before him day and night? And will he delay long over them? So Jesus asked two questions. Will God bring about justice for his people? And will he delay in bringing that justice when he, when he returns? And Jesus answers these two questions. It's like, you know, you think they're rhetorical questions, and they are, and Jesus just goes ahead and answers them for them so they don't have to like, oh, I don't know, Jesus, what's the answer? He tells them in verse 8. He says, I tell you, he will bring about justice, and he will bring about it quickly. So will God bring about justice for his people? Yes. Will he delay long to bring justice when he returns? No, he will not. He will do it quickly. When Jesus returns, he will take care of our enemy and he will do so quickly. The wait for his people will be over, the struggle will be over, and justice will come. Which is great news. It's great news that we are, as we pray and we wait for him to return, we know that when he returns, he's going to take away the trouble that is in us and all around us. And it will be instantaneous. We will not have to wait for it. We will immediately get to rejoice and see the King of kings and the Lord of lords do what he does. And then Jesus asks a third question. He says in the second half of verse 8, However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? When the Son of Man comes, when Jesus returns, will he find faith on the earth? Jesus answers the first two questions because they're his to answer. And the third question, I believe, is left open-ended for us to chew on and ponder on. When Jesus returns, will he find faith in me? When Jesus returns, will he find faith in our church? What sustains our faith until he returns? What will keep us longing for his return? What will help us not to lose heart? Remember the answer, it's all the way back in verse one, it's to pray at all times. So how will we have sustaining faith in the, when trouble surrounds us? We pray at all times. Prayer will sustain us and our faith until he returns. In the verses we read today, Jesus clearly communicates this that the need for us is to pray and he welcomes our prayers. And as it comes to further encouragement and application uh, surrounding prayer, we could be here all day long. And as I sought the Lord for wisdom and discernment and what to encourage you with, here are a few things that I pray are helpful as we draw near to God in prayer. Just five things to consider as we look to pray at all times knowing that it's for our good and for our help and for our faith to be strengthened. The first thing I would have us consider is, do you have a plan to pray? If we are to pray at all times, I think sometimes we can just kind of go about through, through our day and think, oh, I'll just be able to, connect. I can easily connect with God whenever I want. And that's true, there's a reality there, but do we actually do that? Are we actually mindful about how we want to interact and when we want to interact with God? We have a plan for a lot of things. 
But do we have a plan to pray? So I would say, do you have times set aside to pray? Actual moments on your calendar during your day, during your week that you have set aside time to pray, for you to pray alone. Consider starting the day with prayer. If it's not normative for you, spend five minutes and see what the Lord does with that. Pray during the day. I don't know about you, but if I spend the time with the Lord in the morning, when it comes to about one o'clock or 1230, I can quickly forget because the troubles of this world have already started to come and I'm so distracted by the things of this world that I've forgotten to put my gaze upon the Lord. And so maybe on your lunch break, take a 20 minute walk and just walk and pray and ask that God would be with you, give you wisdom, discernment, and how to tackle the rest of the day. Maybe recapture time in the car while you're driving. Set aside, okay, each time that I am driving home, instead of listening to a podcast or a book or music, I'll just sit in silence and pray. I would ask you to consider to set aside time to pray with others. Find others that, uh, whether at work or in your neighborhood or wherever, that uh, would also desire to pray with you and spend time praying together. This, I believe, strengthens our desire to pray. This is one of the things that in the last six months, God has used to completely transform my love for prayer. That every morning I have a buddy, different buddy that I get to pray with. And sometimes uh, it just is just the sweetest part of my day. Pray with others. Pray with your community group. I would ask while you're at community group, how much time is spent in actual prayer? Do you throw one up at the beginning and then shut it down at the end? Asking you that God would have blessed your time. Do you spend more time talking about prayer requests than actually praying for each other? Consider flip-flopping that. That instead of spending 20 to 30 minutes and talking about the troubles that are in your own heart and asking for prayer, which is not a bad thing, try next time just starting to pray. And when you pray and others around you hear what you're praying and where your heart is, they're going to know how to pray for you. But let's pray and ask for help from the one who can actually give help. And if we're not doing that with our community groups, where else would we do it? What if you spent 30 minutes praying in community group? What if you spent an hour? Would that feel weird? Would that feel awkward? Just begin to just commit some time to pray as a community group and see what God does with it. I'd say, hey, commit to plan that while you're driving to this building, whether it be Sunday morning, whether it be Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday morning, Wednesday night, pray in anticipation that as you're driving to this place that you would feel the presence and love of God and that those who you interact with would feel the presence and love of God, that we would show up with great anticipation that our God is at work. And that as we leave this room or even during the meet and greet or as we are in the lobby talking or as that we are outside talking as kids are running around doing who knows what. And we ask, hey, how was your week? And someone says, it was a hard week. Don't just say, man, I'm sorry to hear about that. Put your hand on their shoulder and say, man, can I pray for you? I pray and I ask God that we, his church, would be a people who plans to pray. I ask the question, do we actually lack the time to pray or do we just have too little of a value in prayer? My hope is that the more we set aside specific times to pray and specific places to devote to pray, that it would become more normative and that the Spirit may use it to bring us to a point where praying at all times is just like breathing. When I, when I am mindful of my breath, I realize that I need oxygen in my lungs to live. And may prayer be that for my soul 
that when it says, what does it mean to be able to pray at all times, to pray without ceasing? It just means that my desire is to be in tune with the Lord. And I think the more we plan prayer, the more prayer will just flow out throughout our day. I honestly believe that. I've seen it to be true in mine and others' lives. The second encouragement I would have for us this morning is to pray scripture. When we pray scripture, it gives us a chance to rest in God's promises and in God's way. We don't have to even come up with our own words. We just pray God's word back to him. Are you feeling anxious? Have you felt anxious this week? Philippians 4 says rejoice always. Rejoice in the Lord. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but with everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, make your request to God and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your minds and your hearts in Christ Jesus. Therefore, whatever is good, whatever is noble, whatever is right and pure, whatever is excellent and praiseworthy, think of these things. And so we pray, God, would you guard my mind and my heart Help my anxious thoughts to fade away as I dwell on what is good. When you feel tempted that we would pray James 4, submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil, and the devil will flee from you. Come near to God and God will come near to you. And we pray, God, would you help me resist the enemy and draw near to you so that I may feel you draw near to me. God, help me run away from the ways of the enemy and run towards your ways. Are you brokenhearted? Pray Psalm 34, 18. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. God, I feel brokenhearted. I feel crushed. But you said you would be close. Help me to feel that you're close. I want to claim that promise, God. Praying scripture can be a huge blessing to us. Third, pray like a child. How does a child talk to their parent? Most of the time, it's pretty informal. It's pretty simple. Like I said, I have, earlier, I have six kids. And sometimes I think we are a little intimidated to pray because we don't know if we're gonna say the right words or not. And that's okay. Jesus just desires for us as his children to come to him and I'll tell you this, when my kids are hungry, here's what they don't do. They don't come to me and say, dearest father, <laughs> there's a grumbling in my inner stomach. <laughs> and if you would see it fit to go to the cupboard, to reach on the shelf that I cannot reach, and to make me some breakfast, if you have the time to do that, would you do that for me so that at my Stomach may be nursed, and my heart would be full. I have yet to hear that, okay? <laughs> On a good day, my kids say, hey, Dad, I'm hungry. Would you please get me some food? On a real day, Dad, I'm hungry. Okay? Do you know there's, that, that we can go to God like that? He's our loving father. He knows our needs before we do. He just desires for us to interact with him about it. And so we can go to him at times just simple and like a child. Say, God, I'm scared. I don't know how this situation is going to play out. Would, would you comfort me? God, I don't know what to do. Can you give me wisdom? That's a sufficient prayer. You're acknowledging that you're in trouble and you need God's help. It's a beautiful thing. Jesus modeled this when he was on the cross. He just said, Father, would you forgive them? They don't know what they're doing. Your loving Father longs to hear you and to help you. Fourth, Pray for God to feel near in the midst of hard circumstances. Pray for God to feel near in the midst of hard circumstances. Life is hard. It will kick you in the teeth. Loneliness 
is real, severe sickness is real, loss of job happens, loss of relationship happens, unmet desires happen, and on and on. It is good to ask God to help bring relief in burdening circumstances. And it is okay to ask God to change your circumstances. God wants to hear those prayers. And in the midst of our circumstances, one of the best ways he can help us is for us to feel his presence. It's normal for us to want to get out of troubling situations, for God to remove our burdens. But my prayer is that we wouldn't just want to get out of hard situations, but that we would desire uh, to feel his presence, that we would desire to feel his comfort, his strength, to know that he is with us, to know that he is near. Troubles will continually come. And as they come, we don't just ask that God would make them go away. We ask that God would be near. Look at Psalm 23. It says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. Why? Because you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they do what? They comfort me. David has prayed many times, how long, O Lord? Can you release me from my enemies? And that is good. But David is acknowledging that he is in the middle of the valley and he's not taking this moment to ask the God to remove him from the valley. He's saying, God, I just want to feel that you are near. Would you comfort me? Would your presence overwhelm me? Would it satisfy my soul that even though I'm in the presence of my enemies, that you would prepare a table for me? I kept listening to a Shane and Shane throwback of from 2002. The song is just be near. And it just says, be near, oh God, be near. Your nearness is to us our good. And so would we pray and ask God that he would feel near in the midst of our hard circumstances? There's nothing wrong to ask to get out of the valley. We praise him when we do. But would we also desire his comfort and his peace, which I believe deepens our relationship with him in ways that are so sweet as he meets us in those hard things. Lastly, uh, number five, I would just encourage us to keep praying. Just to keep praying. I know that it can be challenging. I know that it can be hard. I know that you're like, God, are you hearing me? <laughs> God, why won't you answer me in the way that I want you to answer? I just want to acknowledge that that's real and that's hard. And we can, that, that, that is a endless conversation that we can have. And I'm, I'm happy to have that with you at a different time. But for our time today, I would just encourage us to keep praying. Draw strength from praying before the Lord. Draw strength from others praying for you. I had a friend that she was praying for me this week as I was preparing, and she sent over some thoughts, and she just had some reflective thoughts of her own time in prayer recently, and I just want to read what she sent me. She says, the gifts of this kind of consistent and persistent prayer this year have made or have been a closeness with God, an intimacy that only comes from time spent and conversations about everything. I have also focused on the attribute, on one attribute per month that has been a sweet reminder of who God is. I have felt connection to those that I have specifically prayed for. Communicating with those people and following up on prayers has been such an encouragement to me as well as to them. I have seen God do some amazing things in the lives of those that I have prayed for and in my life as I have the privilege of joining in on the work, his work in their lives. In those places where the need requests seem insurmountable, if not impossible, heartbreaking circumstances, I have been reminded that God deals in the impossible. 
There are some tough things that I haven't seen any movement on in a long time. And yet, returning to these things and trusting that God is at work behind the scenes, perhaps in ways I will never know, has been faith building. We keep coming to God. We keep coming to God. We keep drawing near and asking for him to feel his delight in us, to, for him to feel near. And why should we always pray so that we don't lose heart as we wait for Jesus to return? We always pray so we don't lose heart as we wait for Jesus to return. As I was saying uh, earlier there was a moment this week I was losing heart fast. I felt very overwhelmed and burdened by some certain circumstances that I had. I felt the enemy coming hard after my mind and after my heart. And I cried out for God to feel near. I asked for a friend to pray for me. He did. My wife prayed for me. I asked my son to pray for me, and he did. My circumstances haven't changed, but I know that he is with me. My heart is strengthened. My gaze is more readily fixed on Jesus. My desire for him to return is great. Yet I know this afternoon I will need his help yet again. Tomorrow I will need his help yet again. In Psalm 121, I lift my eyes up to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and of earth. I'll close with this. I think that your prayer life is an indicator of how you view God and the intimacy of your relationship with him. I think your prayer life is an indicator of how you view God and the intimacy of your relationship with him. And so I would encourage you just to consider that. Because I believe the more we pray, the more connected we feel to God. The more we pray, the more dependent we will be upon God and less on ourselves. And the more we pray, the more our faith is strengthened by and in God. And that is for his glory and for our good. Amen. Well, it would feel weird and wrong to not just spend some time praying in the room. And so I'm just going to guide us with a couple of prompts, but just ask that as we go before him that we would be mindful and anticipatory of what he can do. And so first, I just want you to ask God to help you see him as a good father and that you are his child. and to help you enjoy that relationship. Would you ask to God to give you the desire to pray in ways that you haven't before, that you would find joy in prayer and connection to him through prayer? And just take a moment to acknowledge where you're troubled or acknowledge where you know someone else is troubled and just beg God to feel near.
Father, we thank you for just being a loving Father. Jesus, we thank you that even in the midst of trouble, we can take heart because you have overcome the trouble that is in this world. Spirit, we just ask that you would strengthen us, that you would draw us to you through prayer, through a desire to do so on our own with others. God, I ask that we would not just be people who dabble in prayer, but Father, would we be devoted to prayer like the church was in Acts 2, where they gave their lives acknowledging that we can do nothing on our own, that we are helpless without you, and that we would come to you with great joy, knowing that you desire to help us. Father, would we long to sit at your feet? Would we long to pray? Would we just be caught up in your presence as we sit at your feet, praising you, weeping before you, pleading before you, crying day and night? God, we thank you and we love you. Would we continue to just worship you through song? Amen.